We spend far too much time worried about what makes us different than the next person or better than the next person and not enough time thinking about why we should respect the next person. We all have a story, an overarching theme that runs through our lives and makes us who we are. The problem is, we think that since each of our stories is different, there's not a lot of perceived value or shared struggle. But we have far more in common than we can imagine, and what motivates one person can certainly help us as well. The Third Lab Podcast is about understanding, respecting, and appreciating the struggle that it takes to overcome immeasurable odds in order to reach your destiny. Join me as I interview and bond with some of the most inspiring and incredible people, diving into their why to get a full understanding of their being. Without each other, we have nothing. So let's go on this adventure together and take on the future with open minds and open hearts. Welcome to the Third Lap Podcast. Hey, what's up, everybody? Once again, thank you so much for tuning into the Third Lap Podcast. This episode uh, is the homie, man. So this is, I think you're the person I've known the longest out of all the people that I've talked to, which is crazy. So Mitchell Burgess, man, what's going on, Mitch? How's everything? Everything's great, man. It's good to be here. Thank you so much for uh, you know reaching out and inviting me to talk today. Absolutely, Mitch. Yo, it was a, it's a blessing again to have you on here, man, for us to connect in this way. It really means a lot to me. So thank you again. And so Mitch Burgess is a good friend of my childhood friend. I've known this man for a very long time. We'll get into how we know each other in a second. Um, but Mitch is an independent consultant and also a special projects manager. Um, I'm sure there, there are a lot of other things that you have going on at the moment that we'll also get into as well. But yeah, Mitch, anything that I missed there as far as you just being an independent consultant, project manager, anything else you want to add? Uh, no, uh, that, that's essentially it, man. We'll definitely get into the, the layers of other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And so how do we know each other? Man, I've known Mitch. 21 years. Um, I moved from Philadelphia to New Jersey in, I think, 96. And so, you know, we uh, we connected when I first moved, met this man in seventh grade, um, been rocking since seventh grade, really long time, met him and my wife and my, and my other best friend uh, pretty much around the same time. And so it's been it's been a long time, dude, you know, South South Orange Middle School, we were all real small with big heads back in the day. <laughs> yeah, really. I think I, I probably had the largest of the crew, though. I was also the most the smallest of the crew. Yeah, so, we yeah, were, the head to body ratio was way off for me back yo, then. For all of us, bro. I go back and look at some of those middle school pictures, and I'm just like, like you said, the head to body ratio was crazy. Yeah, we were way yeah, too small. Team of bobbleheads, yo. Yo, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, any memories about us meeting back in the day? Like I said, it's been a really long time. Yeah, yo, man, uh, there is one memory that always sticks out because I revisit this memory often. Um, you and I were with your mom on the way to the crossings and we're in the back seat uh, of the car and we both just gotten Notorious B.I.G.'s uh, Life After Death. Uh, was it Life After Death? What, which album was dead wrong on? When that Eminem verse dropped, it was so fire. I listened to that song so many times. Yo, we kept replaying that song that whole ride. Yeah, I learned that verse that night. Yeah, so every time I hear that song, and I was just listening to it this weekend, I think about being in the backseat of your mom's car on the way to the crossings and learning that. <laughs> Yo, that is hilarious. First of all, the crossings is a super throwback. I haven't yeah. been to the crossings in PA in forever. So that brings back crazy memories. That verse from Eminem. So first of all, like, that wrong is one of my favorite songs still to this day, but we absolutely memorized. Like I could say the Eminem verse right now with no right. beat, <laughs> no nothing, no lead up. I still know that from the bottom of my heart, man. Back of my memory. That's a heck of a memory right there, man. So yeah, we've been rocking for a long time. Trips to Livingston Mall, playing, you know, at Hearn's crib in the basement, you know, all of the all of the memories, man. You know, being reckless suburban kids, you know. You know reckless suburban kids trying to get into some trouble, but not too much trouble that you could really find in South Orange the way <laughs> you know, good thing though for, for young black kids growing up. Um, it was a good thing that we we had to kind of travel to get to that trouble, man. Um, and so yeah, so we talked a little bit about it already, but this is the Rep Your Hood section. So where are you from, Mitch? Yeah, so I guess I'm repping South Orange, New Jersey today, man. Cause that that's uh I guess that's where I became me, you know. 
uh, and my family's still there or, or nearby. I revisit often. So, yeah, that, that's home, man. It's always going to be home. And anybody that knows South Orange and knows Mitch knows that Mitch is famous. The Burgesses are a staple of South Orange. <laughs> South Orange neighborhood. Shouts out to all the Burgesses. I haven't seen, like we were talking before we got on, I haven't seen most of your family in a really long time. Um, did you want to shout out your parents' restaurant real quick for anybody listening that might want to stop by? Absolutely, man. My parents are at Encozy's Cafe, uh, which is on the corner of Riggs Place and Irvington Avenue. The entrance is on Irvington Avenue on that corner. They've been there for seven years, providing uh, high quality comfort food. And, you know, it's just nothing like going in to see, you know, BB, as she likes to be called now, Mrs. Burgess, back there, shepping it up, putting all that love on the food, man. Um, yeah, definitely. And, uh, and uh, I was actually, I was talking to her over the weekend. She mentioned that uh, they are rated as the number one black owned restaurant in their area uh, in Jersey on Uber Eats. And, uh, you know, they got a high score and they've been feeling really good and proud about that. So I'm, I'm happy for them, man. They, they got something good going on. Yeah, absolutely, man. Shout out to Cozy's Cafe. I can't wait to, I haven't ever been, um, but when I go back to South Orange, I'll probably be there sometime soon. If I haven't been by the time this episode releases, I'm definitely going to pull up. Got to say what's up to the Burgesses, man. Haven't seen your mom and your dad in forever. And our, like, I always have such fond memories of your parents. Like, they were always to me, but like, the black suburban family was raising a bunch of really great kids. Um, your aunt was also amazing too, and your cousin Courtney. Like I, I always had so much fun hanging out at your parents at your crib, man. And just being around your family was always dope. So again, anybody that knows Mitch knows Mitch's family. Y'all the people, man. Y'all the ones. Y'all really repped hard for South Stars, and it's dope that y'all are still in the area, man. I love it. Um, and so you know, this is definitely an opportunity for us to reconnect it's been a while since like we got a chance to really talk like this but i would love to really like let's get into it man you know we're here um to really talk about your career and all the things that you've accomplished but like always with the third lap podcast also talk about the things that you've had to overcome to get here um first things first my man mitch went to wharton so this this Wharton Mitch right here, man. This man graduated from Wharton, like so. That's no joke, right? Like that's no joke. To start things off, talk to us a little bit about Wharton, and you know, I know that things weren't super easy for you to even finish that program. So definitely, let's start off with Wharton and talk to us a little bit, or even why you chose Wharton. I'm sure you had other options. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, man. So I'll say that Wharton overall was almost a, a magical experience, and I guess I say that looking back on it now. Uh, but it was magical because I felt like it was the correct or what felt like the right balance of challenging, um, flexible, social, creative, and welcoming. I, I, I never felt like unwelcome at school. Like I felt like I belonged there. There was never a time where I, I was ever out of place. So uh, there was that for sure. Uh, I, I feel like, you know, when I started uh, I had the same experience that most people do. You come in being a high performer from your school, and now you're surrounded by high performers from around the country, around the, the world, actually, because right? there's a high uh, international student population. And now you're trying to figure out, okay, like it's one thing to be the best in a small pool. Now you're really trying to figure out like you know, what you're made of in this program that is designed to test you in every possible way. And, you know, there are all the rumors about the Wharton curve and how hard it is and people being cutthroat about grades and everything. And you see some of that. That's more like personalities. You know, that's not the school itself. That, that's, the, that's the students. Um, but I feel like, you know, in terms of it being a, a solid program uh, that I was both like happy to be a part of and that I looked forward to being in. Yeah, it hit all the marks there. I think the challenges came in in like recognizing like where your strengths and weaknesses are at that time of your life. For me, I was uh, not only like finding myself in school as like, you know, an independent like human being who's like becoming an adult, figuring out what he wants to do is making decisions for himself as you know, we're all doing at that age and not understanding some, uh, I guess, uh, symptoms or issues that I was having at the time that were making school really difficult. Uh, so one of the things that I talked to you about last time we got to see each other was like, oh, you know, I had a lot of trouble with sleep when I was in college. And it wasn't until my sophomore year of college that I started noticing that 
Um, you know, I was just generally feeling fatigued during the day. I didn't really know why. And then, you know, the running joke was, yo, Mitch, stay falling asleep everywhere. And, and I really did. Like, we'd be mid-conversation in the middle of the day, and I might just be leaning, just, just mouth open, ugly. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it took uh, the relationship that I was in at that time for me to learn that, like, I was dealing with sleep apnea and I was not breathing at night. And so that daytime exhaustion that I was experiencing – you know, had a source that I really wasn't, you know, really ready or able to to deal with at the time. And so I had to kind of struggle a little bit to like pull across the finish line. Like I, I had made a decision when I started my senior year that I was going to finish in four years along with my class. Uh, that was a discussion that I got to have with my counselor who actually advised against it. But Again, I think those same things are like both pride and concern and just a desire to like push through where I was like, yo, like this is getting done. Like this, there's no way I'm not crossing the stage with my peers in the class that I came in with. And so that, that that's how that worked out. Uh, but uh, I'd say it was still a wonderful experience. Man. Yeah. yeah, that's that's dope, man. I've heard a lot about the Wharton Curve and I know plenty of being from Philadelphia. I know so many people that went to UPenn. Um, and some folks that went to Wharton. And so you had a concentration in economics or you got your bachelor's degree in economics and then concentrated in finance, healthcare management and policy. So why that concentration? Why that pathway? Absolutely. So I, I think I figured out by my second semester freshman year that healthcare was really where my interest was. Because so I started off like most people. I was like, oh, you know, I'll be a finance major. Uh, you know, that's like what you do when you go to Warren. If it's not finance, you do accounting. And if you don't do that, you do management. But like, God forbid you major in something else. You're like, you're an outcast <laughs> or something like that. Uh, and healthcare management and policy was a new concentration at that time. Um, so I was actually only one of five people that had declared it as an actual concentration. And so we were like the smallest group at graduation holding our little banner <laughs> going across, right? Uh, but I, I just knew that that was like the industry I wanted to be in. The one thing I didn't know at the time was whether or not I wanted to get into like the business of healthcare or to become an actual clinician, uh, like as a trauma surgeon. And that was actually like the one thing I was fixated on was trauma surgery. Um, so I actually had a unique opportunity while I was at Penn. Um, we had this program called Warren Leadership Ventures where like in the middle of the semester, you could take on like a leadership project at a neighboring uh, organization in Philly and basically provide like business consulting services to them. You know, at no charge because we're students, but like leveraging what we know to help them develop a plan or, or, you know, implement something. And I got to work at the hospital at UPenn in the trauma center uh, to do that one leadership venture. And that went so well that they actually invited me back to work there over the summer as like a consultant. Um, so this was my summer between junior and senior year. So I stayed in Philly and I would um, work on like operational consulting type things in the daytime and I would shadow the clinicians at night. So I would like scrub in and like be in the trauma bay, like in the ER as things came in at night. And you know, this, the summers in Philly are hot and wild. So lots of interesting things rolling in. Um, but yeah, it gave me like a really balanced view at, um, at least the two areas of healthcare I was really interested in. And I ultimately decided to at least like start off in consulting and figure, okay, you know, the barrier to entry and to start making money is lower. I can start working now, <laughs> see how I like it, see, um, what I learned. And if I still have that itch to become an actual physician, you know, then I know what I got to do. Um, yeah. And that's such a, like. I feel like when I hear consulting or like trauma physician, <laughs> it's like two yeah. very divergent sort of pathways, two very yeah. different things. And so it makes sense. The the Well, they both make sense. Um, and knowing you, like you're a very compassionate person, very empathetic. So I can see how like the trauma work could also interest you. But what about trauma? I feel like we'll definitely get into consulting because that's the pathway that you went. But I'm right. so curious, what about trauma and like being a, a, a trauma clinician was so interesting or like uh provocative to you that it was it was really getting down to that zero hour of which of the two you wanted to choose i think it was the adrenaline like i one i even recognized that and that like yeah there are like certain rushes that i am more drawn to and that is one of them like being in the hospital and um just watching the level of both uh composure and control that these physicians 
practice at a moment that is like probably the worst moment of that person's life when they roll in. It's a you know highly emotional moment. You got to make very critical decisions, and you really got to keep you know your wits about you, keep yourself calm. And I'd always really admired that, and I felt like I had that level of composure for that type of work. Uh, and I felt like I had a chance to even test that because, like, yeah, that first night in the trauma bay, you see that first bloody patient roll in. Now you can see if you really got the stomach for it, or if you're gonna be, you know, crouching in the corner somewhere <laughs> holding your guts. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think that just like affirmed for me that I was like, I, I could do this. I can see myself doing this. Yeah. I I'm not big on blood, man. You know, I had somebody tell me because I I, use, I have a, a stomach ailment that has been a part of my life my entire life, and so I've been in the ER more times than I care to even count. But I remember one time I was in there and I had a male nurse come to me and just great conversation. He talked to me about his life and his career, and he was like, you know, you can have a really good career as like a male nurse because you're always in demand. Like people fly you all around the country. You know, they'll put they'll pay for you to stay there and all these things. He's like, you should really think about it. And I like I looked around the ER around me and I was like, nah, bro. Like I'm not dealing with people throwing up on themselves. I'm not dealing with the blood. I'm not dealing with any of that stuff. Um, you know, my cousin Jr., who you've met before, yeah. um, so he's an emergency paramedic out in New York um, for the fire department. And I, like listening to his stories are kind of the same of what you mentioned, like that adrenaline. Um, he's like saving people from all types of different scenarios. And but I also know that it, like it takes a toll on you too, right? Yeah. Like because you are a human being, and and it's tough to see people in so many different traumatic situations without it kind of weighing on you. But yeah, no, I believe the adrenaline piece, Mitch. You were jumping out of airplanes and and all types of stuff. <laughs> of <course. laughs> One of the last times I saw you, you were in a cast because of jumping out of airplanes. Hey man. Yeah, I I was I saw you on a scooter, and I'm like, this man missed and jumped out of plane and hurt himself, man. And that was the last jump you said right like that was the last jump before you got certified uh yeah so so that happened and then so that was my 26th birthday when when i got that injury so for my 30th birthday that was my first jump after that uh because i was like there's no way i'm gonna let that be the last jump like yeah. even if i don't ever go forward this can't be the last one yeah man we was high flying i didn't, okay. I didn't have that same it, it, it reignited that rush but not in that way where i was like yeah i gotta go get after it like right now yeah. Okay. Yeah, we get. Yeah. Right. Like we did it again. I'm glad that you dig back up there, man. That's important. Um, and you know, I know it's something that brought you a lot of joy. So I was really hurt to see that you had hurt yourself. Um, because I know like that was a big thing for you. And we'll talk. We'll get into that stuff. You know, we'll talk about Mitch the Adrenaline Junkie in a oh. second. <laughs> You're listening to the Third Lap Podcast with Mal Davis. Yeah. This is Mal Davis here on the Third Lap Podcast with Mitchell Burgess talking about his career um, as a consultant and just as a dope human being, man. So, Mitch, you went from Wharton, graduated, had to make a tough choice between wanting to be a consultant versus wanting to be in trauma. Like you said, the money was there for a consultant right out the gate. And so I see you join FTI Consulting Incorporated in New York City. So talk to us a little bit about joining FTI. What brought you there? Sure, sure. So uh, there were two things that were in play when I uh, was uh, you know, looking for my first opportunity. One, one of the common things that seniors at Penn and at a lot of schools do is they have on-campus recruiting, where folks are like literally interviewing for the jobs they plan to have post-graduation, and they're usually ready to start work in July. So you graduate in May, by July, you're like starting your job, wherever that's going to be. I had decided in my spring semester of senior year that I was not going to be ready or I didn't want to start working in July because I was like, I got the rest of my life to work. I'm probably going to take some time off. So after graduation, some friends and I went on a Euro trip, <clears throat> excuse me, really enjoyed that. I came back home and actually my very first job was working for a DJ company as a dancer at Bar and Bat Mitzvahs. That was the first thing I did after graduation. And that is what I did from... I want to say from October of 2007 until like like maybe February or, or March of 2008. So I started at FTI in January of 2008. And Wait, hold on, hold on. We can't blow by the dancing, brother. So oh, we, yeah. you got to tell us the dancing. We'll get to FTI. You got to tell us the dancing story because I didn't oh, know man. that, man. So, you know, growing up in South Orange, Maplewood, we got to attend a lot of bar and bar mitzvahs. And I was just always so like... 
I don't know. I thought they were so cool. The dancers they would hire to do the lead and follow and the Coke and Pepsi and all that stuff. So I was like, this is my only opportunity to do this, yo. Once I start working corporate, I can't go back. Or at least I was telling myself that I won't get to do this. So I was like, I'm going to do this now. Like, let's go ahead and scratch this itch real quick. So there was a DJ company in Jersey uh, that catered to Jersey and New York. And they did mostly bar bar mitzvahs and sweet 16s. And... You know, it was perfect for me. I only worked on either Friday nights at Sweet Sixteens or Saturdays at Barn Bar Mitzvahs. It was like the easiest money I ever made, just literally freestyle dancing and leading games with these kids. And, you know, the occasional inappropriate adult. And, uh, yeah, it was it was fun. That's what it was. It was the right kind of fun I wanted to have before I started working, like, real for real. Nah, that's dope, man. And, um previous episode i got a chance to connect with my boy dennis pooler and we were talking about like the lack of gap year opportunities for black and brown people but specifically for black folks right um and so that's really cool that you got a chance to explore that and then ultimately like you said have a lot of fun dancing and and working how uh, working weekends basically before jumping into corporate and uh anyone that is working corporate knows like Corporate is is a whole different beast. It's a whole different ball game, especially when you start making money in corporate. It's really hard to go backwards at that point. So you know, I dig it. Get the fun out early, man, <laughs> and then jump in. Um, and as a person that has been recruiting for the better part of the past four to five years, I've done so many on campus uh, pre- like presentations and recruitment events for education. I've been to UPenn actually quite a few times. Done a couple like PD sessions for UPenn. Um, and it's always really fun. It's tough because not a lot of UPenn students outside of that education program are trying to teach. So I like had you been at UPenn when I was doing this work, um, I would have been trying to get you to teach math or science or something, man. I was, I've been trying to snatch Wharton people left and right. <laughs> it never works. They're always looking for finance jobs. They're like, wow. You can't pay me enough to do this, brother. I'm sorry. Maybe when I'm 40 and I'm looking to do something different. <laughs> That's what I've been telling myself. I was like, oh, I'm going to teach fifth grade math, you know, when I'm like 45. Yeah. And so, you know, to all the Wharton folks, man, when y'all ready to transition, Miles Davis hit me, man. We could figure out a teacher job for you. Uh, we could get the job done. But yeah, man, so that's dope. So yeah, sorry. I, I didn't want to interrupt. Uh, well, I wanted to hear the story about the dancing before we got to FTI. Because I know once we got to FTI, it was going to be too late to backpedal. Oh, um, but yeah, talk to us about FTI. You were saying on-campus recruitment and stuff. And so February of 08, you kind of made that choice to go corporate. Right, right. So because I had opted to not do on-campus recruiting, I was, you know, looking for a job in the off-season as a, you know, recent college grad, um, which is risky. You know, it's like, it's not ideal. You know, everybody else already knew where they were going to be working. And, you know, even just like going through people like, oh, like, Mitch, where are you going to work next year? Uh, what do you mean you don't know yet? I'm like, because I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. When I know, you'll know. <laughs> no, but... Uh, I think one one thing that was working in my favor, my parents were like, they actually really encouraged me to take that time off before I started working. I think they were just like, yeah, you know, you've been working really hard, like give yourself a break, recover, relax, and then like figure out what you want to do. Uh, but I, I lucked out in that when I started looking at the end of 2008, um, I made some good contacts. Actually, I, I hadn't even heard of before, but then I made it um, made a contact there. And it sounded really interesting because their practice was new. Uh, the healthcare, the health solutions practice at FCI was only about a year old at the time. Uh, they were very small, uh, but they were growing, and they had never hired a like undergrad, recent graduate before. Uh, but they were willing to meet with me. They uh, the reason why I got the interview was that uh, I had uh, sent my resume, and someone happened to just, like, do a cursory Google, and he came across an article that I wrote uh, when I was at Wharton um, about my experience there, uh, like, doing the Wharton Leadership Venture and being in the trauma center and, and debating the whole consulting versus, um, you know, physician route, and that was actually my lead-in to getting an interview at FTI, like, just completely random, and yeah, they... they legitimately just took a shot on me they're like yeah we actually have never hired anyone your age before everyone else that's here has been doing this like 10 15 years um like we don't even know what you could do but we like we want to try this out with you so they actually only hired me as like uh like on a temporary basis at first like i was a contractor for 
what well, was supposed to be six months, but after the first month, they were like, oh, no, we're going to keep you. Like, so, uh, yeah, it was like, I don't know, almost, uh, you know, I want to say fate, if you want to call it that, but like this opportunity kind of lined itself up and it was amazing, man. Like uh, one going in consulting, I knew I wanted to be in a space where I was going to be traveling. That was one of the big draws for me. Um, I wanted to learn, I wanted to know everything there was to know about hospitals. It's like, I, I know what it's like to be a patient and going, but I want to know everything there is to know about this institution. Like, how does this thing work? And I was fortunate that the team that I joined was like, one, just like super nice and welcoming and encouraging. And when I say they gave me as much rope to hang myself, anytime I asked, I'd be like, oh, oh, I want to go to that meeting with you guys. Like, would you let me go with you? All right, Mitch, you can come. All right, but you got to add some value. If you want to come with us, what value are you going to add when you come to this meeting? All right, because we can't just have you come in to be at the table with nothing to say. Uh, but the fact that they always kind of met me with that uh, and really just kind of pushed that growth, I mean, I, I don't know that I could have had a better first, uh, you know, kind of consulting work experience. And I love that around, like, yeah, you could come, but, like, what do you bring into the table? I think that we all need to challenge ourselves in that way, you know, without always being challenged that way professionally. But it's like, what kind of value can you provide? What are you going to bring to the table? Um, how can you look at this a different way, right? Like even sometimes just having a different perspective than everyone else in the group can add a lot of value. And so you were with FTI for a while. It seems as though you did quite a few different things. Um, what were some of the like dope opportunities that you had a chance to sort of uh, engage in or what were some of the places that you traveled to that you really enjoy um and you mentioned the travel around being a consultant that was the part i hated the most when i was a consultant oh my god like be away from my wife for like two weeks man and i came i always tell people this story so i was away i was in boston and i think i went to dc so i was away for like two two and a half weeks so i finally get back home i was talking to my wife like on the way back she did not mention to me that my, my pit bull was gonna look much much different than when i got home so i like put my key in the door i open the door freddie comes running up to me and she's all barrel chested and i'm like yo whose dog is this like what happened to my little pit bull man <laughs> she was gigantic barking at me she didn't recognize who i was and i was like okay like the traveling stuff is kind of getting in the way of my relationship both with my right. wife and also with my pet like <laughs> folks don't recognize me anymore that's no good um but i do know that there are people that have that got a lot out of that traveling and so um, what were some of the cool places that you went to, some of the really cool work that you did while you were at FTI? Sure, sure. So I'll say one that what I love the most about the travel was the flexibility it gave me to travel to other places. Um, so at the time when I started, Ben and I from college had this thing. We were like, we want to see all 50 states before our 30th birthdays. And when I was traveling, we had this thing called alternate travel on weekends where instead of flying home, you could fly to another place. If it was basically the same amount of money you would have spent to go to your home airport, you could travel anywhere and just return to the consulting site the following Monday. So that's how I got to see uh, a lot of states uh, that were like either near a state that I was working in. If there was like a national park I wanted to go to, I would just stay over the weekend, hop in the car and drive or fly to Vegas or wherever. <laughs> uh instead of going home so i really did like that part um hey you know like you know what it's like if you're on the road man i mean you're eating you're eating good probably too good so you really got to be like on on your fitness game if that's important to you and that was for me so i'm like yeah all right we could be out drinking and eating all times at night yeah, but i gotta get this workout in real quick man. uh work-wise i would say probably some of the most interesting work i got to do was around analytics and this is because it was a, a new service area, uh, and the way that my career progressed at FTI, the order that you see the um, those sections uh, listed, like supply chains first, and there's analytics, and there's uh, the project management office and HR, human capital. I literally, every time there was a new service offering, I moved. Like, I wanted to be a part of that new team, uh, or I was being asked to go to that new team. And that helped to keep my career at FTI really fresh. Like I got to like become an expert in something and then, oh, like here's this new thing that we're developing and now I get to be a part of this too. Analytics was really fun because that's when I got to take basically what my experience was as a, 
a fresh college grad and replicate that for a team of people. So before me, we didn't have college grads. They used me as like a test case. And then they were like, okay, so let's see if we can replicate this model with other, you know, young talent coming out of college. Like how can we like leverage work to, you know, bright young talent. And analytics was how we were going to do it. Like with the number of clients we were seeing, we were trying to figure out how can we process, you know, hospitals generate a a lot of data. They generate a lot of information. And when we're assessing opportunities there, there's a lot of data we need to uh, request from them. You know, this comes in various formats from various systems that don't talk to each other. It's not always clean. Uh, It's not always organized, but we have to be able to make some sense out of everything we're asking for and then tell them how we're going to help them either save X millions of dollars or, you know, make this new service offering a thing or buy that new hospital, whatever it is that they're trying to get to, we have to be able to take all these disparate pieces of information and, and create a plan. And that analytics function, like growing that team to be able to be the engine behind our like directors, managing directors, going to more places to be able to more quickly respond to needs and like having like a, a home base in DC and in Chicago of like really sharp analysts and, you know, have the opportunity to like coach and grow talent, like, and to pour into them what was poured into me. Like, I, I wish people could have had the kind of first work experience that I had. Uh, and that's like not even like putting any bullshit or glaze on it. It's like, it was really just a, a great encouraging environment. And I wanted to replicate that for the, u- the new young town that we're bringing in. You're listening to the Third Lap Podcast with Mal Davis. Yeah. Yo, that that's awesome, man. And yeah, I, like that first experience out of college is so important because I feel like the, no matter what you do, like burnout is real. And oftentimes you end up feeling burnt out earlier when you're not in a place that's super supportive or is encouraging your like your your intelligence and curiosity the way it seems that FTI was. Um, And so it's cool. Yeah. Looking at your resume, I see like you definitely were moving around. um, But all of these things seem to be areas that will push you, but also seems like areas that you would also have interest in. Um, It's one thing to kind of be like, hey, Mitch, go lead project management, the project management office for us. But if you don't have passion for that work, then it's like, okay, how long can I really see myself doing this now? Um, And so, Mitch, you had mentioned your goal initially was to just have a, a core fundamental understanding of how hospitals worked, right? And so through your time at FTI, it seems as though you were able to really get a comprehensive under, like, look underneath the engine. And so I would love to just hear your perspective on, you know, what are some of the things that we do well right now versus what are a couple areas that we can grow in? Um, and the reason why I ask is because clearly we're in the middle of a pandemic um, that we don't necessarily see ending anytime soon. And this pandemic really put a stress on like our hospital systems and our healthcare systems in a way that I think surprised a lot of people um, living in, you know, progressive country, um, a country that generates so much money annually and spends so much money annually. I was kind of surprised, but I also know people that work in the industry. So not as surprised, I think, as some people were. But I think collectively, we were all surprised that our hospitals got to the breaking point that they did so quickly. Um, and so I would love any insight that you can provide around, you know, what are some of the things that you saw? You don't have to name any hospitals specifically, of course. Um, but what are some of the things that you saw that were made sense? And like, OK, I like the direction that we're heading versus some of the areas that potentially we still need to grow in as a country. Uh, so in terms of what, what we saw in uh, the pandemic, it really wasn't surprising, at least from my standpoint, the strain that we saw on our healthcare, um, you know, resources is because generally most hospitals are, like don't run, uh, with a high profit margin. Most of these institutions already are barely breaking even or actually losing money year over year. And that's kind of hard for people to believe when they think about, well, think about how many people there are that like go in and out of a hospital and how much you charge for these things and insurance and like, how is it possible that you're not making money? It's like, it's, if you got into the actual financials of a hospital, you would see that like, yes, there's tons of money going in, but there's there's that much more going out. And there's a lot of things that hospitals don't get paid for. Uh, There are a lot of services they provide that they do not get reimbursement for. 
if their coding of said services is incorrect, they don't get paid for. There, there are a lot of times where a service may be provided and they're not going to recuperate any money for it. And they have to just eat those losses. So to find themselves in a super strained state where, like, again, because of the urgency, they don't really have time to be, like, fiddling with insurances and things. Like, we had a, it's an emergency. We got to service people and we'll figure out the financial piece of it later. I mean, our hospitals were not designed for, uh, you know, mass hospitalization either. Like, we actually just don't have the capacity for that. And that's why we saw, even in New York, bringing up, you know, an old naval ship uh, to dock to create space there and create some, um, you know, additional capacity in Central Park and, you know, all these other kind of like pop up things just really speaks to the fact that like we, we don't have that many beds like we our system is set for regular use, like what we see year over year, you know, like most hospitals will never see a time where they have to like turn patients away, you know, unless you're a level one trauma center where you just like are maxed out because it's a particularly busy night. Most places have capacity for patients, um, but you know this was a really particularly stressful time. Yeah, that's I love the perspective there, and having read the checklist manifesto, um, he, he the author alluded to a lot of what you're talking about now, which is that like operating at a loss. I was shocked that they operated at a loss. Like, I, I mean, call me naive, whatever you want to call me, um, but that they eat so many things um, just was surprising to me. And so, again, when we got to the point where, like, these beds were maxed out and these hospitals were really on, like, the fringe of, of just collapsing, basically, for lack of a better word, um, I think that it was an awakening for us as Americans of, like, yo, yeah, this is the U.S., like, people say the greatest country in the world but even this hit us hard and like we weren't prepared because like you said people are we're we're good for regular operation but it's like when we have to get stretched to the fringes um that's going to take us out of capacity and and really kind of move us in a way that i hope um changes you know i hope that like people and there are so many intelligent people in the healthcare industry that i'm really hoping that like changes come down the road through policy, through laws, through whatever it may be, um, even economically to kind of change this so that we're not potentially put in this position again, because this won't be the last pandemic, you know, like that's just facts. Even if they happen every hundred years, that means a hundred years from now, we'll be facing another gigantic pandemic that'll stress us as a, as a country and as a world. Um, and so, yeah, Mitch, you know, that was kind of like off script a little but i was just curious to get your perspective there um and so again you were at fti for quite a few years um and then decided to make that transition to becoming an independent consultant so talk to us a little bit man you know it's different when you're working for someone versus working for yourself so why did you decide to make that change after um, working at fti for so long uh simple i wasn't happy that was really what it came down to. Uh, I think the, so I was at FTI a total of nine years. I would say after the fifth year mark is where I probably started to lose the passion for it, but the money was really good and it was, it was, yeah, it was good. And I just had other uh, plans in sight. And I also felt like, you know, it's a trade off that I think a lot of people make where it's like, okay, Maybe you don't love your job, but you're making a lot of money, and therefore you can use that money to treat and or entertain yourself in other ways when you have time. It's fact that you don't have time, <laughs> like you know, or, or you have to be very strategic about going going about getting that time. So, uh, I think by the time that last year came around, I already knew it was a move I wanted to make. It was just like, when was I going to pull the trigger? And you know, it was actually like a very quick, just kind of like, all right, now feels like the right time. Um, and even in going independent, like I knew I wanted to consult independently, but I didn't even want to jump to that first. Um, fashion was still uh, kind of lingering as this thing that you know I've always really enjoyed. And I was like, well, you know, let me see what I might enjoy doing in this space, or if there's some way to marry some of my skills from here with something that's in the, the fashion industry. And uh, by that point, I had already started dabbling in design with like leather accessories and bags, you know, all that. And I really wanted to try out being a stylist. Uh, so like doing personal styling and like editorial magazine work. And, you know, that was another one of those times where, you know, I took some time, I took like six months and did nothing. Like I, I probably like traveled 
hung out at home, you know, ate a lot of junk food, you know, whatever. Really just like had a good old chill time. And then uh, I think once I started deciding that that was something I wanted to do next, an opportunity presented itself for me to like actually go in and be a stylist. And I mean, it was a little nervous, nervousing or nerve wracking uh, from the standpoint that like, I knew I wanted to do it, but I hadn't done it before. So when the opportunity came to do it, I was like, it's one of those things where like, you're literally like flying the p- plane or building it as you're flying. Don't want to look like you don't know what you're doing, but you really need to like appear competent because now you're signed on to do this. Uh, but it was again, like one of those kind of magical experiences where when it was done, I was like, Oh yeah, I, I got the, I feel supercharged. Like I, I want to dig into this a little bit. So um, it gave me a chance to connect with some good stylists here in New York and assist a lot of people, which is kind of necessary if, if you want to build your portfolio. Uh, I think what I learned is that I still enjoy fashion. I don't enjoy the fashion industry, at least working in that particular way. Um, I know it's a few things. I was 33 when I was going into that space, assisting, uh, you know, established stylists, but their other assistants are like 21. So, and not that like age is the issue in itself, but like us uh, as a work team have different styles, we'll put it that way. Um, the other thing was that like with styling in particular around editorial, the mundane nature of, you know, you're getting these concepts or you get tapped to do a photo shoot, you go to these fashion houses, you collect clothes out of everything you collect, you will shoot maybe 25, 30% of it. And then of that, maybe 10% of it will end up actually, you know, in a magazine. Uh, and then you got to return all that stuff and do it all over again. And uh, yeah, just like the constant running of like, why am I like schlepping garment bags all over New York City? Um, and this doesn't even feel creative because like a lot of the times when you borrow from these fashion houses, you have to put them in the exact look. Like you can't alter... Like, so if it's head to toe from hat down to the shoes, you either shoot all of it or you don't shoot any of it. Can't mix and match their stuff. So it's like, I'm basically just taking a whole outfit and putting on someone. That, that to me is not style. I'm dressing you. Like, yeah. So uh, that was fun. But I was glad that I took that detour first. Because I was like, this was another one of those things. I was like, I want to give myself this opportunity to see if I'm going to like it. And if, if I don't like it, that's totally fine. We'll, we'll move on to the next thing. And, you know, the transition from that to, you know, starting to independently consult back in operation things was seamless. Like, actually, I was doing both at the same time. And then I was like, okay, as the styling's winding down, I'm just going to, like, ramp up my work. Um, and, you know, again, I think that, like, I was fortunate that when the time came for me to, to source work for myself, that I had contacts to start with, uh, to start, like, seeking out opportunities. Because, you know... I was not used to selling myself as a product in that way. When you're part of a consulting firm, there's a sales team that's taking care of all that. You show up and you make sure the job gets done. Now you have to be, you know, the the sales team and the operator and, and you know, everything else. And yeah, I think like being able to talk about yourself and the value you bring in a way that feels um, genuine and not, uh, I don't know, like blowhearted and like completely inflated, there's a careful dance to like letting somebody know, like, yeah, like I know what I'm talking about, but I'm a nice person. <laughs> like that. Yeah, that is, that is a tough line to walk, man. You know, having sold my services before, um, and talent management specifically around like independent consulting for finding teachers and like leaders is hard. Um, yeah. because I am my worst hype man by far. Like, I am terrible at hyping myself, even with the podcast. And, like, you know, thankfully, people have found a lot of enjoyment in it. And I'll even deflect that. Like, it's not even me. Like, it's the people I brought on. Like, I'm blessed to know such dope people. Otherwise, I wouldn't have any content because, like, I'm boring. Like, you know, it's not me. Um, But, yeah, so I can definitely relate to, like, the difficulty of selling yourself but Mitch, you, you're just an incredible person. So, you know, I think that a lot of the work that you've done and continue to do probably sells itself, which makes it a little bit easier, right? Like somebody could just look up an article on Mitchell Burgess and like find all of the dope stuff that you've done. And, you know, uh, like they just probably shelling out the money at this point. But, um, and so, you know, now that you are independent consulting, what are some of the things that you're working on? Who are some of the people that you're working with? 
Yeah. So what I'm currently doing, I'm with a, a charter school network uh, based in Brooklyn. And uh, this has been uh, really exciting and new for me because I hadn't worked in the education space before. And, um, you know, education has been one of those things that's been like lingering in my mind. So when I think the opportunity came to start working in it, I was like, I was like one of those weird full circle moments where I've been jokingly telling myself I was going to be a math teacher for like middle schoolers for a long time. And I'm just inching my way there. Right? Uh, but you're listening to the third lap podcast with Mal Davis. Yeah. What I love about where I'm at right now is that I find that I'm bonding with some of the same things I love about healthcare, which is probably a little altruistic in some senses, like this idea of like helping. Right. Working for schools, just like working for hospitals, if, if we can improve the institution, then we can improve the outcomes of said institution. At least that's how I look at it. So uh, being in a space where, you know, this charter network, which is 11 years old at this point, uh, but is on a, a strong growth trajectory, uh, has a very solid diversity by design mission, um, great educators. I mean, I've not yet come across a teacher either directly or indirectly where I was just like, wow, like, why are you in the same room with children? Like, they all seem really great. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but in terms of like what I'm actually working on, uh, being in operations and or looking over their special projects right now, one of the things that is uh, in play is a merger, a uh, very unique merger. Uh, the first of its kind in New York State uh, where two uh, charter schools that were established independently are going to merge um, where our network is going to essentially uh, acquire this other school. Um, because it has never been done before, kind of learning as we're going. Like, I know how merger works, right? But we're doing this in the context of, you know, uh, New York City and New York State institutions that have policies and red tape and all kinds of stuff. Um, and all of these institutions are now doing this for the first time. So the huge upside is if we get it right, you know, this is now a model that I could see other schools other charter networks pursuing in terms of growing like not like having to start a whole new brand school a brand new school somewhere else you know it might just be that a smaller network you know ends up getting absorbed uh, into a larger one that may have like better systems and standards in place to you know really uh you know kind of improve educational outcomes um so that's probably the highest priority is this merger that 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 is slated to like eat up my uh, like academic year this year. Um, uh, aside from that, uh, it's been really great just getting to help develop operations at this place because, I mean, one, there's already a great amount of talent, uh, both in the, the school-based leadership and at the network. Um, but it's a classic situation. You know, anything that started off as a either mom and pop startup kind of thing, as you grow, it's either like, you know, your systems and standards grow with it or you just get bigger and you're still trying to like use masking tape and the old systems you had in place. Um, and when you meet, when you reach that critical point, that's where you really got to invest in your human capital because like they're the people who are going to really carry the growth. Um, I think that they were already on the right track to make that transition. But, you know, operations is a high turnover space in education. Um, you know, a lot of the times the folks who work in operations are folks who are either coming right out of school or have like a very particular uh, skill set that's suited well for, for schools, but it's, it's not going to be lined up against like education. Like the, the amount of turnover you would see with your operations staff that's in the school, it's just really common to see folks kind of come in, maybe stay for a year and then move on elsewhere. Uh, but, you know, I actually feel like they have a, a lot of retention uh, at the network I'm at now. Um, but being able to help develop career paths and career trajectories, um, creating the community there, like uh, academics, the teachers have such a wonderful community already established because they are teachers and the network already knows how to like engage them and to celebrate them and to, you know, as they should, because teachers are amazing and deserve all the praise and then some. Your operators, where they may not be providing education directly, but they are the engine that makes sure the school is open and functional and safe and all those other things, especially at a time like this. And uh, I've been really drawn to like investing in that group because 
one, like these are also like people who want to grow as operators and will be future operational leaders at schools if that's what they want to pursue. And um, there is a value and a pride that I want them to feel in the work that they do. Like, no, you're not in the classroom with the student, but you're making sure that like this is this building is safe enough for them to even be in right now, and that is important. So, yeah. Yeah, it was interesting when I went to Uncommon Schools. That was the first place I saw. And I think it's really similar across the board with charters, but like that instructional leader, so your principal and then your director of operations. And like you said, you know, and the DOOs that I know that I've seen in action are in the building in a very intentional way. Like they're helping kids get to and from class when necessary. I saw a DOO wiping up vomit in the hallway one day because like that is a part of their job. Um, and like you said, the instructional component isn't necessarily what they're managing, but they're literally managing everything else. Um, and so the operations piece is so important. And, you know, I've had the fortune of working with some incredible DOOs and, and people in the regional office that focus on operations. Operations has never been my strong suit. Um, I am still not there just yet, but I have learned from some really dope people ways that I can improve. And so, you know, Mitch, I'm hoping that you could toss me some nuggets of, of improvement too. I'm, I'm look, man, listen, I got to get better. Operations is so important. You know, it's, it's cool when you can talk the talk, but if you can't walk the walk, if you can't lay the foundation and make it happen, um, you, you top out really quickly. And I had, I, I tell the story all the time. Um, I had a former supervisor, Odette Clark, shout out to Odette, who really challenged me. She was like, you know, you, you have the ability to talk, but if you ever learn like operations and systems, you'll be unstoppable. And she told me that five years ago. And, you know, that really was my goal from that point on was like, OK, like get better every opportunity that you get. And, you know, from an operations standpoint, who I was five years ago versus who I am now is completely different. Still not. I'm, I'm maybe at 50 percent. I was at like zero percent when I started. So, you know, I'm making strides, man. But, yeah, it's, it's so important. Um, Shouts out to the uh, charter school that you're or the charter network you're working with now. I actually know quite a few people on the talent team there. I work with okay. them. Um, Actually, I work with one of them at Uncommon. She left to go to there. And then also I met quite a few other people working for Selected Incorporated, um, helping them with their talent. So, yeah, great organization, um, really great people. I can tell just from the folks that I know there. And then the fact that they hired you, clearly, I mean, they're doing it correctly. Um, very interested to learn once the merger does take place, not if, but when, because I know if you at the helm of it, it's going to be successful. Um, really curious to see how you all set that precedent. Anyone that knows anything about schools and education in New York City and New York State, red tape is the least, like, it, it's like mummy tape, man. You, everything you're doing is you pulling at it, pulling at it, it's, it's tape everywhere. Oh, yeah. um, so I know <laughs> that cannot be easy, man, but, you know, having you at the helm of it, I'm sure is really helpful. And I know that you'll get everybody going in the direction that they need to be. And so again, this is Malcolm Davis, Third Lap Podcast here with Mitchell Burgess, independent consultant and all around just rock star. Um, and so Mitch, we have to talk about the difficulties we touched on it a little bit but the third lap podcast man it's not a, it's about the triumphs but it's also about the tribulations what, what you had to overcome and what you had to push through to get to where you are um you know you're now here as an independent consultant but i know and we've talked about you know some of the things that you've had to overcome um you talked about the sleep apnea at wharton um you talked about kind of losing your passion while you were at DTI or FTI, I'm sorry, which ultimately led you to becoming an independent consultant. But talk to us, Mitch, like what are some of the things that you've had to overcome personally, professionally, um, and, and really get a, a hold on for you to become the man that you are today? Sure. So uh, there are probably two things I'll call out as like being at least like truly significant in both difficulty level and me having to like, make some firm choices for myself to be a, a happier, more whole human being and professional. So I think the one thing, and this is probably common, is that, you know, when you go to a school like Wharton or uh, actually, no, not even just Wharton, I feel like when you go through the college engine, it is ultimately to make you employable. That's the point. It's like you're getting a degree. Yes, you're focusing on an area of study. You have your ideas and the things you want to pursue. 
But you going about going to school is about making you employable. So you can go and work for someone else to do whatever it is they need you to do. And yes, there's some glamour in that and there's some pride in that and all those other things. And they may pay you handsomely, but will never be even a fraction of what they are making <laughs> off of your efforts. Uh, and I wasn't even so worried about that. Cause I'm like, yeah, y'all probably like caking off a hundred times over, but I'm, I'm, I'm comfy right now. So we, we all right. Uh, when that wasn't enough anymore, or when I realized that like, even in trying to add my joy with experiences and travels and things, I just like still wasn't happy. Like that the bulk of my time being spent either on the road or in front of a screen for this particular job was not generating joy. And if anything, it, it seemed like it was taking it. Um, yeah, it, that's when I started feeling like it, it was time to, to make a change. Now, this wasn't as easy as saying, okay, like, all right, um, Friday, I started feeling like this isn't good, and Monday, I'm ready to go. This took a couple of years because, you know, again, like, you're, I, I was starting to, like, divorce myself from all the things I told myself I needed to be to be successful in this world. So that, like, I'd gone to work so that I could have, an, you know, a white-collar job of this kind of, you know, caliber, if you even want to call it that, and to be doing this kind of work and, you know, to wear this kind of stress as a badge of honor, like, yo, I, I'm out here, I do this. Like, this suit means that I put in long hours and that, like, like I'm about getting the job done and I should be proud of that. And I was for a while. I really was. And then, you know, gradually I just wasn't. Or just, you know, that, that pride started to turn into, um, I think, concern that I was, like, so willing to give my best energy to this thing that wasn't really fulfilling me and I was willing to give so much time to this thing. And that like, once I realized that I was not pulling from it, what I was taking from me or what I was giving to it and that I had become okay with it. That was my concern. The other thing, uh, and that kind of weaves in the sleep troubles and even like my like wavering feelings about like my professional life is that I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder too. And it like was a lot of, there were a lot of things that were unanswered before that. A lot of things about my own moods, behaviors, feelings that I just didn't understand and could not get control over. And they were getting worse as I was getting older. So when my sleep was getting interrupted in college, I didn't realize that like, actually, no, my sleep was interrupted before that. I was already sleeping very little in high school. When we're at Columbia, I was probably clocking about four hours a night max uh and even then my parents would like happen to come down to the family room at, like 2 30 and i was like man you're still up like what are you doing like i would just be up like working on something research whatever just like had all the energy in the world and felt like i would always have that energy and i didn't realize then and i don't think they realized either as much as they kept telling like oh you know mitch like you're gonna burn out you need to chill out i don't think they realized that that was the onset and I definitely didn't know either that like I was experiencing hypomania and that like I had this charge that I was feeling that gave me this energy to do all these things and to not want to sleep. And that felt amazing. And why I felt like all this stuff was just like, like this is how it's supposed to be all the time. Uh, yeah, I didn't know that that was what was happening. So college where like I had my first crash came down from hypomania and I didn't know why all of a sudden all these things that I had so much energy to do I was so excited to be a part of that I just didn't have the energy to do it anymore or I wasn't interested but I had already signed on for all these commitments I mean and college I like went in I loaded up I was in two dance groups it was on the Blackboard undergrad association board um you know clubs work study jobs everything <laughs> and Again, like that was my normal pace, and I felt like it was always supposed to be that way. So, and you know, it took a while one for me to figure out that like something else had to be in play. I had to become more open to even like listening to what that could be because now it's like everything that I feel I know about myself is about to become a question. And unfortunately, you know, I rode that, you know, kind of I rode that speeding locomotive into a gray area for too long. And it was, it actually turned out that like not long after I departed from FTI and as, as great as I felt leaving, that was a decision that I made very abruptly during a hypomanic state. And I was still happy that I did it. Um, and I was prepared like I had money put away, like I was ready, but it was one of those things that like, 
between my departure from FTI and October that year. So I left FTI in, in February of 2017. October of 2017 is where I finally crashed, like completely crashed. I had like sunk completely into a functional depression. Uh, I wasn't really, I wasn't sad. I wasn't happy. Uh, but day by day, I was just kind of like losing a desire to keep trying whatever it was I was working on. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, I, I made an attempt on my life in October of that year. And luckily that did not, um, you know, I'm still here, obviously. I had to go to the hospital. They kept me in the psych ward for eight days, you know. But that was something that, like, I would have been ashamed to admit before. But when I think about what that experience gave me in terms of, like, not really a wake up call. There was like a rebirth that happened there that I, I, I wish I could put it into words what it felt like uh, because it was like all of my greatest fears were colliding at one time in this one place. It's like I, I have to admit, like ultimate defeat, like, you know, everything I thought that I, you know, was uh, geared up to do, like, I'm not able to do it. Uh, like, I don't want to, I don't want to live anymore. I'm like ready to just like be out of here. And, you know, I can tell anyone that this is what was happening, or I didn't want to. It's not that I couldn't. I didn't want to tell anyone that I was going through all this. So, you know, me ending up in the hospital and my family coming there, because I had a choice. I didn't have to tell them that that's where I was. Now, I think they would have at least, like, been concerned after a few days of not hearing from me, because, uh, you know, they take your phone and everything when you go in there. You're listening to the Third Lap Podcast with Mal Davis. Yeah. But, uh, uh, I also made like a very like spur of the moment decision when they checked me in and they said, do you want your family to be notified? And I said, yeah, why not? You can tell, you can call. Uh, and I knew that like when they came, I was going to have to confront that fear that, that, you know, that strong man that they've known for all this time. They're going to see me like ashy in some hospital scrubs, and no haircut roaming around the psych ward looking crazy. Um, and that's what it was. It, it really it ended up being that. But you know what? My, they were so supportive. Uh, I mean, one, like, I mean, uh, I didn't expect anything less from them. But for me to be in a position to, like, be on the receiving end of that kind of support was something that I never imagined. Uh, and it took a lot to, you know, accept it. But I was much better for it after doing it. And shit, when I came out of the hospital... Now, I mean, I wasn't 100% fixed ready well when I came out. Uh, I really just wanted to get the fuck up out of there, to be honest. And I did what was necessary, and I told them what they needed to hear so I could go home. Um, but, I mean, this is going to sound fucked up. I mean, being a psych ward is every bit of crazy as it looks on TV. Like, it is very much a cast of characters. Uh, but you are in this, like, weird community of people who are all, like, at their worst at the same time for different reasons and you're all stuck together there's nowhere for you to go uh and you're all in this like raw form so you're all just like telling each other like the wildest shit that you probably just did recently <laughs> uh how, how have you got there uh you know you got some people like this is like their fourth time in there other people it's the first time uh you know you just don't know it's like going into another dimension but um when I came out of there, it was like everything that happened before that was completely wiped away uh, in a good way. I'm uncomfortable because like I'm I'm out in the world again and I don't feel like I remember how to be the person I was. And uh, this is scary because like that old script, like I don't even know where that is. I don't know how I'm supposed to show up now. Uh, so I did like learn um, and it, it, it Probably sounds a little crazy, man, but it's like learning how to crawl and, and walk again uh, emotionally. I had to, like, when I did get out, the first thing I did, I mean, I went home, sh like, took an actual, like, legit, real home shower, because the hospital shower is not hitting on anything. Um, got a haircut. Once I brought I had to, like, clean myself up a little bit. But honestly, I didn't leave my apartment again for, like, two weeks. Uh, and it was mostly... I was too anxious to go anywhere. Warm up the courage to be seen. So I was like, I'm just like in this, like, you know, completely 
you know, raw form right now where like everything that I thought I was like, obviously it wasn't working. So like, now I got to figure out like what to keep, you know, what not to bring back. Like, how am I going to like construct a life that I can live going forward? And, but it, it put me in a place to basically like check every rule I ever made for myself. So, you know, this whole, you know, like it's cool for you to be the ear for other people. You should like keep all your stuff to yourself. Or like, you know, you shouldn't need help or, or just the fact that should is a dangerous word one way or another. Uh, like I always tell people to use the word should with caution all right, because that's a weighted statement all right, and it does not apply even. Um, but it gave me a chance to be happy. That's what it gave me. It gave me a chance to be happy. It gave me a chance to figure out what makes me happy and what doesn't make me happy to be okay with what doesn't make me happy. And and to not take those things on uh, out of this idea of should like I should want these things I should be doing these things this path that I've been on before suggests that I should be going in this direction like actually no like that nothing about what I've done before dictates what I would do next and I actually love that and if I look back over my life it's how I've been living my life anyway yes I've like put in a lot of time at certain places but I've always given myself the chance to do the thing I really want. And that's not going to change. I'm going to always give myself the chance to do what I really want to do when I know what that is. I don't know what that is. All right, cool. <laughs> so as I'm not getting into any trouble, I'm all right. But like, I think when 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 I know I have uh, you know guidance or direction somewhere, I'm always going to look for that. Mitch, I love you, man, and thank you for that transparency, yo. You know that that story in and of itself, and you describing your experience. Um, ties into the Third Lab podcast because in every episode we've touched on mental health. You know, you knew me when I was in my worst state as far as depression. I got diagnosed when I was like 15 with clinical depression. Um, and that's something that I've struggled with my entire life. Um, derailed a good amount of my life. And so, you know, I know what it is to have to redefine yourself and really figure out who you are all over again. Um, you know, like it, it is... Is liberating in so many ways. Um, and I think that anyone that knows me now as an adult and, and sees how I operate, my wife, it, it pisses her off because, you know, I'm a person I kind of just do what I want. Um, you know, I take her feelings into consideration, but I know Allison is like, yo, this dude is a wild boy. Um, but it's also because, like, that's just how I am. And like you said, when I have something that I know I want to do and know I need to get done, like, it's going to happen. Um, and so, again, Mitch, you know, I'm extremely grateful for the transparency um, knowing your family, there was no way that they weren't going to support you through that. Like, you know, the amount of love that I saw in that household amongst all of you, even, you know, siblings bicker and, and you know, the, the age differences and all of those things. But I know for a fact that like they love you, you love them, you all love each other. And so I'm glad that they I'm first I'm glad that you allowed the hospital to call them. Um, because like that's that first step towards admitting like like something is wrong. Um, and then again, that like they rallied around you. I'm sure that that really helped to get to get you to where you are now. Um, knowing that you have that safety net and what you said about should is so real. Um, being a loaded word and what we should do. Um, a lot of times isn't even in our best interest. We're making those things up and making these rules up for ourselves, and a lot of times setting ourselves back. And so, again, man, I'm glad that everything is is playing out in a positive way for you, that that attempt was unsuccessful, which means that you're still here and we have an opportunity to have this conversation and just, you know, Mitch, you're a dope dude, man. And, you know, I think that a lot of people don't necessarily get to see or hear what happens behind the scenes with you to just see the successes. Um, and, and again, why I like to focus on what are some of the things that we've had to get over, because that tells the full story, right? Like, you know, when we see the the success of a person, we have no idea what it took for them to get there in the first place. And so, Mitch, you talked about having to redefine yourself. What is your motivation, right? Like, you know, you you had to build up the courage to even, again, leave your house after, you know, getting um, getting out of the hospital and, you know, having to really put the time and energy into figuring out who is Mitch Burgess, what does Mitch Burgess want out of life? What is your motivation? What motivates you to just keep pushing forward the way that you do? Uh, it's interesting. This is probably going to sound, actually, you know, let me not assume that it's going to sound like anything. Uh, my motivation is joy. 
that's it. Like I am going after the things at, like in all the Maria Marie Kondo-ness of sparking joy. It is literally how I'm making my decisions for now. Uh, I don't necessarily see see that changing. And the reason why is because I allowed all of the shoulds to define my trajectory before. Uh, I basically relegated the things that really do interest me to like my hypomanic evening hours. Because like and, and the hours between 12 a.m. and 4 a.m., like that's when you know Mitch gets to explore all those other crazy things he likes to do. But like he's a committed corporate whatever like during the day, uh, and that like I don't know, just like prioritizing things that really aren't even that important to me over the things that really are. Uh, but that had become such a seamless practice that you know again we we learn how to do that very well uh, as people uh, prioritizing other things. Uh, so unlearning that and then giving myself permission to experience the bumps and bruises of putting myself first. So understanding that that is like not always comfortable. Sometimes the thing that I might want to do may not necessarily be what I should do um, and being okay with that. Uh, but that has given me a chance to not judge myself while I'm making this, uh, you know, kind of progress forward. And the reason why that's so important to me right now is because as much as I love even independent consulting, I think I even knew, um, over the last couple of years that this, this is a pit stop. Like this is something I want to do right now. something I like to do. Uh, I want to get this experience of being on my own and to know what it's like to, um, you know, be the driving force behind my success more directly. Um, but ultimately when I boil down anything I've ever done, you know, minus the creative stuff, it always comes down to problem solving. It's my favorite thing to do. Like problem solving has been my favorite thing since I was a kid. It's like jigsaw puzzles, word problems, Bring on a Sudoku, bring on a crossword. It's like, I'm in puzzles. Uh, I was like, well, you obviously love solving puzzles. This has been like the kind of work you've always pursued. So what's a puzzle you want to solve? What's one you're interested in working on? And for me, I think the events of the last year, not even just the last year, has just like made it so clear that like I want to invest whatever creativity and value I have left into growing the... What I want to call it, growing the spirit and the future of the black community in this country. Like I don't know where I'm gonna plug into it, whether it's in local politics. That's like something people ask me about a lot. I tell folks like it's not that I'm opposed to politics uh, in any you know way, and I understand that like even in those forums, you kind of have to show up a particular way depending on who your audience is. My thing is like, yo, but my life needs to be mine. When I leave here, like, we could do this all day. When I go home, my life's got to be my life. And if that can't be the case, I really can't have y'all like worry about what I'm up to on a Friday night. So, yeah, I mean, I'm worried. But uh, being engaged in an organization or an effort that is more directly tied in either into the development, either the financial um, uh, aptitude of our community. I'm talking like from the very beginning, from childhood, like, Folks got to know what it is to have an account, what it is to have credits, what it is to buy property, these things that like, I don't know why we don't teach these things in school, but requires a more focused effort. Um, I mean, pick any one of the ailments playing our communities, how, even if it was back in healthcare, like, I just know whatever I'm doing next, got to marry those things. I want to take whatever I've learned so far and I want to apply that to solving a problem I'm genuinely interested in and committed to solving or at least being a part of the solution. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you, man. You know, as I think about, you know, I feel happy where I am currently, but I also know as I get closer to 40, like I'm going to get that itch to really address what you're talking about, like, you know, the ailments of the black community. Um, and like you said, there are so many you could do. You could start education, healthcare, financial, um, even access to food and food deserts. And Dennis Pooler, um, on one of the earlier episodes, we talked about one of his homies who's addressing even bringing veganism back to the black community um, and the importance of veganism in the black community. And I'm not a vegan, but I understand the importance of it and, and, and understanding, you know, the origins of it and what it can do for you as we deal with all of these different health issues in our communities and why COVID, you know, ran through our communities because we have all of these 
underlying health issues. Like we have all of these things already um, as a part of the black experience to a certain extent. And so, you know, I'm right there with you, man. And, you know, I think that everyone that's been on to this point on the Third Lab podcast really shares that same sentiment around legacy and building out a legacy and being remembered for doing something for other people and not for themselves. Um, you know, it's nice to stack money. You know, it's nice to feel comfortable. We want to be able to take care of our families, but you have to extend it beyond just your small circle of people or your tribe. Um, if you're not using your skills in that way, you got to really question, you know, what you're doing, man. You know, there's some people that don't care and, and I'm cool with that. They will probably never be on here. Um, but, you know, if if you're in it for yourself, understand that like you can even give a little bit of your time to help others and, and feel so much joy from it. And, you know, what our therapist always tells us is black joy is a revolutionary act. And it's so true, man, because, you know, we were never supposed to be joyful and joyous. Um, we're supposed to work and then die. And that's just not it. Like, I'm not here for that at all. So, Mitch, you know, we're, we're now here at the end. We've talked about who you are, what you've done, what you want to do in the future, you know, what you've had to overcome to even get to this point in the first place and what motivates you to be great. And, you know, your story has just been incredible, man. I, I am so happy that we were able to connect in this way. And so I would love for you at this point to give some motivational thoughts to the people. So this is really just a segment here, three minutes to kind of summarize. What do you want people to walk away with? All right. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to use something. Or I'm going to impart to the folks what my dad imparted to me. And both my parents are reinforced a million times over. And he used to say this to my siblings and I all the time when we were younger. And it was like, don't worry about how just think about what you want to do all right if you get too worried about how you're going to make it happen you'll never take the first step and i used to think that was like the most reckless thing i was like what do you mean like you just like you just like just start doing stuff and i used to be like you know in the backseat with my dad when he would like go buy an open storefront and see something and get inspired like yeah i'm gonna open something right here and then like a day later he's already off at like home depot buying stuff it was like what's going on he's like i don't even know you know this place is dope i just don't want it and I'm gonna figure out what it's gonna be. And I used to watch that and be like, that's so odd. Like that, that's just so anti my like systems way of thinking about doing things. But it always just seemed to work out. So, you know, magic aside, and I'm not saying it's that, because like obviously the work was put into that. But the takeaway from that was that like like you do not want to paralyze yourself from taking that first step. First step's never meant to be perfect. It's never meant to carry you all the way to the end. It's just a step. All right. And I, when I think about the number of times where if I just allow myself to rest there and just go and I rely on the fact that like, you know, every time before now you have proven to yourself why you are who you say you are, why you've done what you've done and why you can do the things you say you are going to do. So don't diminish the faith you have in yourself. Take that step and continue from there. Like, you know what you're doing. Like, you got to give yourself a little more credit. Um and I think that's helped all my siblings and especially me as I've gotten older, where you become more risk averse and more concerned about the outcomes of things. And granted, I don't have any dependents, so, you know, I could be a little, little more wild with mine, but I still hold that very dear to me about like not getting caught up in the how uh, and just focus on the what. Yo, I love it. Um, and I 100% believe that that was the the information that your parents were giving you and your siblings, man. Just seeing all the things that, you know, you and your siblings have done. And, like, you all have done it in different ways, but you have actualized what your parents have accomplished. And, like, seeing your dad have, like, five different spots in South Orange. And I'm like, yo, and in my mind, I'm like, yo, how does he keep doing this? <laughs> Like, yo, the dude, like, it's a shop popping up everywhere. Like, yo, what is going on right now? Um, it, it's so amazing. And it's dope that you were able to see that firsthand and, like, learn from that example. Um, the episode before you, Teddy Gandy from Black's Apparel, he mentioned that, you know, um, it's just important to just do it. He's like, it, what he said in his in his motivational thoughts is, it's not that hard. Um, and I took so much motivation from that and motivation from what you just mentioned, because a lot of times it, it, it's not that hard. Just do it. Just start. Yeah. Do something. Um, because if you do nothing, you'll never get to where you're trying to go. And, and you know, that that's a big piece. Um, Mitch, before we close out, though, because I wanted to get your book list, too. 
But there was something on your resume here that I found really interesting and I just wanted to like hear you just weigh in on it a little bit. And so it's the Gay Men's Loneliness Project, which is a documentary and discussion group. Can you just talk to us a little bit about that and what that is? Yeah, sure. So uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Caesar, here in New York City, uh, he and I started working on this. Um, this is like almost two years ago now. Um, but uh, we it started off as just uh, discussing with, between the two of us, uh, you know, two gay men in New York City who, you know, Caesar's 50, um, you know, has lived a very full life, is still living a very full life. Uh, but we were just like kind of talking about the things that we had like experienced as like, you know, men who, you know, you grow up. You live your life, you know, trying to, you know, pursue, you know, the model that's presented to you. You have that, that time in the closet and what that does to you as a human being uh, and how that carries into your adult life. Um, you know, when you learn to lie or deceive people or to just not be your authentic self and the amount of unlearning you have to do to get out of that um, to, you know, essentially find your yourself later on. And as we were like going back and forth, we we're like, yo, this this conversation is bigger than the two of us and it probably should expand. But what are we going to do? How are we going to do this? Um, so it started off as just like a documentary project where we we're just going to talk about the two of us. And actually, Ryan, my younger brother, was shooting it. Uh, and so this was also really cool because, you know, so my my siblings are all super supportive. Like they don't have any qualms about me being gay. Um, but in terms of like my brother having an opportunity to work with me on something on this topic and to hear me talk about things he's never heard me talk about before, uh, was like a very rich experience and continues to be a rich experience because, you know, one, he's getting to know me in a way that he's never gotten to before. He's learning about something, uh, about a group of people that he doesn't necessarily like identify as, but like is now learning about like the effect that this has on a particular group of people. And it's, um, I don't know, it's just really helped bubble up uh, the fact that, like, none of our experiences are unique. Like, all the things that people walking around, holding on to you, carrying, you sit down and you talk to a room of strangers and everybody's telling the same story, more or less. Uh, so that documentary then continued to grow. So we were like, okay, so now it's two of us. And then it was four of us. And we we're trying to figure out how we could have a more balanced view uh, while keeping it strictly on men of color that, that was our one thing we're like this gay men's loneliness project but our target audience is men of color uh and we actually got you know some flack for that when we first you know kind of started uh advertising and sharing about it uh but the fact is we both believe and i still believe that like there are just certain experiences that you cannot know if you're not a person of color black brown or whatever however you identify yourself and no one wants to be worried about qualifying their experience at that time. And a moment of talking about something that is traumatic, difficult, whatever the case is, you need to be free to do that and know that the person on the other end has, you know, a proxy for understanding. Um, so then it became a discussion group at the LGBT Center in New York City. So we got to have our first session that was attend, um, there were 48 attendees uh, that came. Um, I knew very few of them but this was just a, from us like you know kind of growing this talking about it we might have shared one post on instagram about it but you know obviously this was something that people were really hungry for and they showed up and then COVID hit. <laughs> so uh we had uh six sessions scheduled at the center we only got to do that first one uh and then everything shut down but then we started doing virtual sessions uh like later in the, it was early summer um and so uh, for me, it was more about, I, I like the documentary aspect, but I don't want to do a film where we're just talking about the issue. And that just goes back to my nature as someone who's solutions oriented. We can talk about the problem all day. What do we want? What do we want to leave people with? What do we want people to take away from having engaged in this project? And I think the documentary being us not coming up with an answer, but us capturing us being willing to just dig in, just to take a step. Like, we're not experts on this. We were literally just two men that had a conversation one day and decided like, yeah, we're just gonna do this shit. And it has grown from there. And I think like the more people react to it and you know, reaffirm how needed it is, it gives more encouragement to like see how far it can go. I mean, it, it could just be a documentary. It could end up being a whole, you know, a fixed program at the center, who knows? Um, 
but I think we're just open to seeing where it goes and we're just happy to jump into it. I love it, brother. Um, and congratulations to you and Caesar and for everyone that's been participating. That's awesome that Ryan is, is taping it, you know, because like you said, he gets a chance to see his brother as big bro in a very different way. Um, I remember Nick and Ryan as little, mm-hmm. little kids, man. So it's crazy that like these dudes are grown now. To, <laughs> it's just bananas, bro. Um, but, you know, and it's funny listening to you talk about you and Caesar and the conversations that you all had. Like, that's literally how this podcast grew, too, which is having dope conversations with people. And one day I was just like, I should probably record this stuff. Like, <laughs> I should probably create a platform where, like, we can have these conversations and other people right. can listen in to them. Um, because, like you said, we're not going through this by ourselves. Um, you know, we have so many shared experiences and so many things that we can learn from someone else that it's important that like, you know, if people are willing, let's put ourselves out there and make a difference. And so Mitch, you know, I see that you are and continue to make so many differences, you know, not just in healthcare or in education, but also within the gay community, which I feel is like super important because they see someone like yourself that's super successful, um, but is also willing to like walk it back and pull back the, the the guards to show them exactly what you've been through and all the things that you've had to do. Um, Mitch, man, you, like I always say, man, you that dude, Mitch, without a question. Um, and so, you know, you gave us your motivational thoughts. What are some things that you've read or, or you would suggest reading that will really help our listeners? Uh, one book that I've read um, that was really helpful, like when I was just reaffirming myself and the book itself is like really like easy reading but it's called you're a badass have you ever heard of this book um i'll tell you the author because i can't remember off the top of my head that book was insanely helpful when i read it uh and it was again because it was such an easy read and the book is just reminding us like yo like why like how and why have you forgotten how amazing you are like let me just remind you real quick in an easy simple way and i got to end that book being like Y'all got to do, yo. Why am I in here sitting in the shadows, yo? I'm like, get up, yo. Uh, let's see. I've been reading the autobiography, uh, autobiography of Frederick Douglass. Um, so I read this. The last time I read it was probably the year after I graduated, but I wanted to read it again, just in everything that was going on uh, this year. And I was at one of the protests back in, uh, was, it, was it May? Well, of course, that's really like, and we're at the Frederick Douglass statue in Harlem at 110th and Central Park North. And I was just like, I have to read this again. Uh, so it had been sitting on my night table for a minute, but I cracked it open again and I started reading. Uh, and I'm just reminding myself of like, again, just like the journey. Um, when I look at Frederick Douglass, I mean, when I look at leaders in general, but when I look at Frederick Douglass and I imagine what it's like to create an existence for yourself that's not necessarily outlined for you from the beginning. Like someone who's decided that like the lot in life assigned to me is not the one that I want. I'm gonna go about carving out a new one for myself. And yeah, like that that's how I feel. I feel about being in a space where a chance to do what was quote unquote assigned to me, what was like what I was supposed to be doing as you know, whatever qualifiers I met that said I'm supposed to be a white collar a corporate type uh, pursues this particular kind of success and these kinds of motivations and things. And just to be reminded that like the path forward is mine to create. So, yes, look forward to finishing that. Yeah, and it's funny that you mentioned you're a badass um, by Jen Sincero. So the first episode, Sharif King, that was his first book suggestion. So, right. uh, folks, this is now, this. so that's two of them. So if y'all haven't read it yet, get to it, man, because Mitch, if Mitch and Sharif are telling you to read it, read that book. I actually have not read it myself, but I am on Amazon right now placing an order for the paperback. So I will have it here in the next couple of days. I also have, like, 40 books to read. I've ordered so many books through this pandemic and I have been moving so slowly through them. Um, But I I definitely plan on getting through that one for sure. And so Mitch, where can people find you on social media? Um, You know, and also if people are potentially looking for like consulting services and is the documentary like, has it been completed yet? Or is there any information you can share if there are like men of color, gay men of color looking to potentially sit in on some of these? Yeah, sure, sure. So uh, in terms of social media, I'm only on Instagram. 
uh, at MC Burgess two number two uh, is my main account, and then Made by Merrick uh, M E R R I C K uh, is where my leather accessories uh, are listed, um, and then uh, for the GLMP, there's um, an Instagram profile for that as well, and it is GML. P project. I'll confirm that for you. Um, otherwise, uh, they can just email me at mcburgess at gmail.com uh, to get connected to GLMP and well, we can get them hooked up with Caesar and brought into the loop. Um, yeah, it's all my social media, man. Awesome. Yeah, I just followed uh, me by Merrick. I'm a, I gotta get some orders in here, man. I see you. And if you, man, listen. This man must be doing it on social media, man. The man is on Instagram. He's a social. He's a he's an Instagram rock star. Um, I love the pictures that you take. I feel like you know they're always on brand. And so yeah, follow Mitch. Um, if anyone is interested in joining in on the like talk group or sessions, you can reach out to me. I can connect you with Mitch so that you can get more information. Um, and Mitch, yeah. So dude, we made it to the end. This this was a pretty long episode, but I feel like. You know, you you had such a motivational story to tell, and you were dropping so many jewels throughout this process. I was like, all right, let's keep rocking. If Mitch is rocking still, he ain't telling me he got to stop. Then we're going to keep on rocking. <laughs> and so well, at the end, Mitch, you know, this has been, again, such a pleasure for me. Um, I'm so excited about just the opportunity to have you tell your story on this platform. I appreciate you taking the time out tonight uh, from what is, I'm sure, a very busy schedule, um, you know, Mitch. And also, this dude is like, you did salsa, right? Dancing. Oh, yeah, I'm still dancing. Salsa man. dancing, still dancing, yeah. you know, jumping out of planes. Like, this man, Mitch, is out here living life. I love it, man. <laughs> hey, yo, my, my, uh, everybody, well, all the women in my family call me Twinkle Toes now. My mom Twinkle started calling me Twinkle Toes in college when I was Twinkle. started dancing there. But now that's what they be calling. It's like, all right, what Twinkle Toes up to? I'm surprised you're not somebody's stage tonight. Not tonight, man. <laughs> not tonight. <laughs> something else to do tonight um that's awesome so any last words for the people before we sign out just to thank you to you man like one i appreciate you uh you know reaching out and uh you know inviting me to participate in the podcast but i'm just like so happy we got to like link up have this conversation reconnect Definitely. man see you looking like malcolm circa 96 <laughs> only 2020 uh yeah, man, this is this is really awesome, and and like I said, man, I really I really dig the premise of the podcast. Like, there's something special. You already found the special sauce in the podcast, man. Like, I'm just excited to see it grow. Be safe out here because COVID is still out here taking numbers, and so you know, be safe, be responsible. As always, this is the end of the Third Lab podcast. Each one, teach one. We all learn together. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Third Lap Podcast. This is your host, Mal Davis. Please visit the thethirdlappodcast.com for more information about the podcast, about our guests, and also to see our reading list. You can find us at the Third Lap Podcast on LinkedIn and Facebook, at Third Lap on Twitter, and at Third underscore Lap underscore Podcast on Instagram. If you know anyone that would be great to be featured on this show, please reach out to our host, Mal Davis. He's always looking for interesting people to learn more about them and to talk about their pathway. Thank you so much again. Have a good one.